Thanks for joining. This is our ninth, tenth meeting, which is a nice number as we're closing the, the year. As always, a quick reminder, uh, all of these calls are recorded, so you always find them in our YouTube channel. Um, before we hear from core devs on the latest updates, I just wanted to share what we're in the, that we're in the process of uh, revamping not only these calls, but also how we share all of these core R&D updates with all of you guys. So moving forward, you'll have access to recorded like um, ad hoc meetings the uh, different teams are are having, as well as what the uh, canonical roadmap looks like and the different formalized working groups we have here. So we will be organizing all of these using the uh, Foundation's Notion workspace, so it should all be fairly accessible to all of you. Um, this monthly call specifically will then be used as a way to share and discuss updates as we'll do today. Those will be coming from different working groups as major milestones are hit, basically. So do stay on the lookout for future updates. We'll post everything in the forum. Um, cool. So since we've had this call, this last call two months ago, I think we should take a couple of minutes to hear from other core devs what they've been up to. So alphabetically, uh, I think, uh, can we start with Edge Node, Yanis? I think that's the first letter we have. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> cool. I'll quickly share my screen just to uh, walk you through the nodes I have here. Um, yeah, so I'll dive right in. Um, we shipped recently um, a new Rust gateway that replaces the old one that was written in TypeScript. Um, it has much better throughput, so it should be able to carry at the very at least hosted service, you know, um, amount of amounts of volumes. And you've all seen the charts on, on Twitter about the traffic we're seeing there. Um, so this should be able to, to handle that uh, easily. Uh, also, there have been a number of index selection reliability improvements. Um, so you know, primarily to improve the, uh, the client or consumer experience. Uh, when, for instance, there's faulty indexers uh, that we fall back to others in, in better ways and that we also score them uh, more dynamically so we react more, more, more quickly to changes in the environment. Um, there have also been new graph node releases uh, and new indexer releases. Um, and especially, yeah, both of those really are, are super important. And if there's any indexers on the call today, um, I urge you to update uh, your indexer service at least and graph node, but I think index agent um, in the same way. Um, the biggest change that that I personally am, am excited about and interested in is um, the GIP20. Um, this is unex untestable indexer responses um, has been released as part of these uh, versions. And um, that's why it's so important to update because this is um, a way that we uh, can in the gateway detect when certain indexes have issues that are, for instance, due to like a corrupt database or something else. And um, if we can detect this, that means A, um, the indexer doesn't, you know, doesn't get used for that particular query result and isn't on the hook for, um, you know, attestations for problematic results um, that they themselves probably don't have confidence in, but don't know that something's up. Um, it also means that we can detect uh, these from the consumer perspective and fall back to other indexers and um, who hopefully don't have the same corrupt database, right? So these are uh, these are just catching errors that are specific to individual indexers, you know, are not part of what's expected. Uh, you know, it's not like query syntax errors that graph node detects or something like that, or like schema mismatch errors, but it's really um, errors that result from you know, something being broken on the indexer. Um, so this is super important because it also increases the reliability a ton. Um, in the in the network, so yes, please please update and please read the the release notes. They will have um, a lot of information. Uh, what's currently in progress uh, on uh, Edge Node side is that we are uh, planning what we call file data sources. That is a GIP out for that. Um, I believe in the forum as well. So this is essentially replacing uh, what was previously uh, IPFS CAT basically. So it's a supposed to support um, file storage networks like IPFS uh, or Arweave um, and basically segregates out the, the files that we fetch from those networks as part of subgraph indexing um, from 
data sources like you know, Ethereum contracts or, or near contracts. So this is being planned as a pretty in invasive uh, feature uh, and it's been in the, on the pipeline for a long time and we've you know, wrecked our brains on how to solve this. And um, hopefully this, this time around will we'll actually you know, um, make it happen. Um, there's also a number of performance optimizations that we're investigating at the moment um, to speed up indexing performance. Um, the first ones that we will be working on most likely are um, on the trigger side, pipelining uh, the block stream, so pipelining um, the filtering for uh, relevant triggers um, so that we don't do that in, in sequences or block ranges, but we, we you know, pipeline those, those block ranges. Um, there's also uh, work ongoing to make um, the firehose work for Ethereum it will work or make it work well for Ethereum. So um, specifically one area that we're looking into is um, filtering, like pre-filtering uh, information that the firehose passes to graph node um, in, on the firehose side and providing those filters um, that are subgraph specific um, from graph node. Um, to just make sparse subgraphs uh, or block ranges where there is no information, um, just you know, faster and not pass all the blocks over to graph node. Um, and then on the store side, we're looking into um, pipelining uh, writing entity data back to the store, just so that when you are done with the block and you you want to write the entity changes that were not that doesn't block processing, um, and we can continue indexing additional blocks while we are um, also queuing the writes up. Um, there's also uh, an investigation into using uh, copy versus insert statements, which are supposedly faster. I think newer Postgres releases also have a built-in pipelining mechanism. And so we're looking into a few of those kind of improvements. Slightly bigger feature that we're pondering to introduce are immutable entities. A lot of cases, you know, uh, where you, for instance, have transfers or something, you create a transfer entity and that never changes. So um, that would make a lot of things um, simpler and, and faster in graph node when you, when you know the entities never change. Um, yeah, and last but not least, we also started working on, uh, previously talked about as sort of integration testing or, um, or proof of indexer cross-checking or dispute analysis. This is now kind of all rolled into one, one effort, um, which I think uh, like index or cross-checking is a bit more appropriate for. Um, so basically have a way, a system to continuously cross-check indexing results and query results across different environments. And those could be indexers, those could be custom you know, graph node setups to compare different graph node versions, for instance, and see that they um, you know, index identical uh, like generate identical uh, data from indexing subgraphs. Um, could also be uh, run in a network mode where all the indexers in the network are cross-checked or it could run in a peer-to-peer -peer mode that different indexers can run and they can configure other indexers to collaborate with and like get detailed information from uh, to help debugging or like uh, detecting uh, discrepancies in the data or in the query results, uh, just to give them more confidence in that everything is running fine on their side. Um, so this work has also started and we'll share more information about that you know, pretty soon, I think. That's probably not a complete cool. list, but this is, this is an update from Edge Note. Perfect. Thanks, Janis. Right, right on time. Uh, if we have five minutes for each, that, that would be, that, that would be great. Uh, Figman, Joseph, are you on the call? I'm here. I'm gonna, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna start with some challenges right now that we were having. Um, the first one is around the, the performance for syncing order block heights. And um, this is something right now is current, uh, like a task under research. So uh, we have it here under challenge, but at the same time, we have it under next steps. So we are currently trying to find some strategies and doing some research about uh, how we could actually increase uh, the performance. And I think this is going to be like a room for collaboration with the other uh, core dev teams as well. And we faced um, some issues related to the merger and um, we created a tool actually to verify uh, uh, 
the integrity of uh, this merge file. So we have it here in achievements. So this is like a challenge that was re resolved. And so for everyone here on this call, everything that we're doing right now is around integrating Tenderman. So we are close to the final steps right now. So there's a lot of finalization and some bug test the fixing and testing. And on the active side, we are implementing right now the Tendermint within the Graph CLI and wrapping the last pieces of the extractor package. And those are like the few last steps for integrating Tendermint. And we were able to finish the event trigger refactoring. And uh, as I said, uh, we fixed a lot of bugs and improved the uh, and did some updates on the ingester stack. And we are running right now the entire multi-node setup. That's uh, uh, the ingester, relayer, merger, firehose, everything. The plan is to keep it running for two weeks now to be able to test it and check if there's something uh, malfunctioning and if we run into some problems. And uh, yeah, that's it like um, for, for everything that we're doing currently. And the next step is actually the deployment of the firehose stack, keep testing it and uh, create a full full subgraph, which we're gonna be using actually also for our testings. Great, thanks, Joseph. Okay, let's move on. So, we sure. have, yeah, we have Alex from streaming fast. I believe these guys are also pretty busy. Okay, so, uh, so let's do that. So we have done a lot of uh, work on Solana in the past. We, you, you guys know there's been a release of uh, the near stuff. This is continuing a little bit, processing the net, the test net. We put a PR out to, to update uh, uh, the latest data schema there. So near should be uh, more advanced and ready to be uh, you know more used. So everyone out there, if you want to have near indexing, try it out. Go ahead. Now is the time. We've done a lot of Solana work, but also uh, we're continuing that work got more hope there's a lot of things that need to be managed there uh and we might have some discussions today if we have the chance about you know how we're going to share that if no everyone wants to synchronize from genesis which is pretty hard uh that's one thing i would like also to call to all the people who are indexers that have not yet spun up as fire hose please do if you want to be the a kingpin in the graph run a fire hose and start you know, start uh, doing that work so we can accelerate, you know, the uh, the performance improvements uh, downstreams or for subgraph developers. Get involved in that. It's, it's pretty cool. And you're going to be really highlighted. We're going to have a little board there with your face or something uh, when, you, when you're uh, when some of the first to do that. Uh, we've been tackling some uh, BSC issues, a lot related to the nodes. So that's been annoying, you know, people confusing the graph subgraphs and the nodes. Um, Hopefully we can bring the firehose for BSC soon. So we get that performance boost that comes from having it. So if you're interested to be a, a more kingpin, do that with BSC, satisfied with the demand. Uh, we're working right now on a lot of improvements to the, like like uh, Yanis told us about um, the performance and the uh, sparseness of files. So we're implementing transforms right now for Solana, which is required and then ingraining that for acceleration of uh, sparser queries or, or, or larger speed filtering on whole histories. So that's approximately it, right? Oh yeah, so the team is also working to make sure that call handlers on Ethereum work well with the firehose and doing some comparison stuff. So that's gonna be cool. Okay, I don't wanna take too much time here. We've done, we've done a little bit of a collaboration with Figment, which I'm really happy we're going to continue on doing and uh, and reviewing the, the, the GIPs coming out of there, the Tendermint work. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. May, we, we might have some time to properly dis discuss that uh, today. So cool. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of teams there. I, I'm counting seven on this call, which is crazy. And we, we don't have everybody here. Uh, so I'd like to take also the time to um, shout out to the guild uh, also a, t a new team that's been actively working on subgraph features you might have seen their schema prototyper announced on the forum as well this was a wave one grant uh, and i believe we have dotan on the, on the call so maybe dotan you want to introduce the yeah. team and tell us what you're working on really yeah sure um so i'll start with a short uh, introduction so um 
Uh, I'm Dotan, I'm a member of a group of developers uh, called The Guild. Um, we're a group of uh, open source developers, uh, mainly focused around uh, GraphQL. Um, we're also part of the GraphQL Foundation. We're maintaining the uh, reference implementation of GraphQL uh, and we help with uh, the maintenance of uh, the GraphQL spec. We're also working on like uh, tools around GraphQL, like Graphicals and a few more. Um, and we're building tons of uh, open source uh, around uh, GraphQL, like GraphQL Mesh, uh, GraphQL Cogen, Inspector, ESLint, uh, tons of more tools. Um, yeah, we're super happy to join uh, and be uh, part of this huge uh, thing. Um, we just joined like a few, officially like a, a few days ago, just the contract uh, signed. Um, yeah, I, I won't take, uh, much time. I have a very quick update uh, on what we're doing. Um, we're taking like baby steps on learning uh, graph node and everything uh, related to it. We're trying to compare and learn uh, from the implementation uh, based on our experience and knowledge from the um, GraphQL ecosystem that is not Rust specific. Um, yeah, uh, I have a few more here. Um, like the, the few more updates. Uh, the biggest thing we're going to work on uh, soon, I guess, will be uh, API versioning and uh, composition of subgraphs. Um, yeah, that's all for me. Super excited to be part of uh, part of the thing. Thank you, Pedro. Amazing. Thanks, Dotan. It's good to know we have a new team focused on GraphQL stuff. These guys know what they're building for sure. Uh, subgraph comp position will be a, a major milestone, hopefully, uh, in the upcoming months. Cool. Thanks, Otan. Lastly, uh, we also have LimeChain. You know LimeChain, LimeChain has been uh, working very closely with us. There's a lot of uh, new tools coming out. Specifically, we have a new one called the uh, Subgraph Debug Tool. I don't think m m many core devs know exactly what this tool does, so it might be a good time to talk a little bit about this. Um, do we have, I think I saw Ilya on the chat or Petco. I don't know. Guys, can you update us? We are yeah. both here and uh, I'm giving. In. Cool. Thanks, Pedro. Can you guys hear me? Yes, perfectly. Hi, Petco. Cool. cool. So, yeah, uh, Zoom doesn't seem to give me feedback uh, on the sound. Um, uh, yeah, so basically we, we are the team behind the matchstick unit testing framework uh, and um, I think I spoke on the last core dev uh, meeting about Matchstick a bit, um, but yeah, what's what's really um, what's sort of the big news right now is this uh, debug tool uh, that was mentioned. It's it's also called a, a subgraph forking uh, tool. Unfortunately, our teammate, the developer who was mostly involved with uh, integrating this into Graph Node, is not here. But I can just give um, a a brief uh, explanation. So the whole idea behind the debug tool was that uh, really often a subgraph will fail for some reason uh, after it's been deployed and after it's synced uh, a few million blocks, uh, then at some point it will fail. And in order to actually check if, um, so in order to get the subgraph uh, up and running again, you would need to fix what you think is the issue if you have the right logs. And then you would deploy again um, as a subgraph developer, and you would hope that you had fixed the issue. Uh, but then, of course, the subgraph usually starts syncing from uh, the beginning, so from the block zero, uh, which is not really good because it can take a really long time to actually see if your fix has done the job. Uh, so what this uh, subgraph debug tool will allow the subgraph developers to do is um, it will basically run their mappings um, using the store from the failed subgraph. So essentially, it will just run locally just one block, just the block that the that the subgraph failed on, and it will use and it will use the store that's already in the failed subgraph store, right? Because the subgraph was syncing just fine until now and it is the most recent block that's that actually uh is causing the issue uh so that way subgraph developers can get feedback on if they've managed to fix the issue really fast uh so that's the main thing that we've done um the debug tool has been finalized and it is actually part of graph node and uh i can maybe share 
uh, here in the chat or um, on the Discord, uh, some more information about that um, once I'm done. Uh, yeah, otherwise there will be a new version of Matchstick releasing uh, in the next few days, uh, which has a lot of bug fixes that have come up in the Discord channel. Also a lot of new and um, useful features that we will describe in the release notes. Um, I guess one of the one of the more important um, new features is that Matchstick will now have first class support for Docker because uh, initially we tried going with the approach of having binaries for um, a, a lot of operating systems already generated and so that the subgraph developers can use the compiled binaries when running Matchstick, but that didn't turn out to be the best idea because um, a lot of subgraph developers reported um, issues locally. So that's why we think that uh, the best way moving forward is to actually use Docker right out of the box. Um, of course, if the subgraph developer wants to do so, um, they can. They have three options basically: using the compiled binary, uh, using Docker, and building Matchstick for themselves locally, and then using that binary. Um, Cool. So yeah, I guess that's the that's the most important uh, thing. And in the future, uh, we will be researching uh, a Cardcat plugin, but I cannot give more information about that since it's very uh, early stages um, for now. And of course, we will be working on stabilizing uh, more features in Matchstick. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. I will send more information about everything that I just spoke about in the chat. Thanks, Petko. Uh, I think it's going to be a game changer for sure for subgraph de developers. Okay, great. Thanks all. Um, I have also, um, like you've seen also semiotic building, cool stuff. Uh, we might want to talk about it, but I, I, later, to, later, later on, maybe we just need to speed up based on the agenda we have, uh, and I think we're going to talk about something that's really re related to what Sem Semiotic has been building. So, um, like, we've recently had, we re we, we've recently seen this EIP for first proposal, that's something hot in Ethereum right now. Uh, this proposal effectively adds um, historical pruning to Ethereum clients, and you probably have seen Vitalik mentioning the graph as one alternative to Ethereum archive nodes um, serving such historical data. Um, can we talk about this? I, I, I know Zach and others, uh, others have written a great blog post uh, uh, about it. I can I can link it here as well. But uh, yeah, I think we have Zach on the call. Might be a good time to uh, talk about this. Uh, yeah. So yeah, P four fours is a, a very exciting opportunity for for the graph. Uh, ecosystem as a whole and in the core devs. Um, what it is, is that um, I can hear someone typing. Is that you, Pedro? Okay, thanks. Um, as, as a part of the push for Ethereum 2.0, um, developers, sorry, I've got my, my notes just disappeared behind Zoom and I'm, I'm lost. Just give me one second for technical difficulties. All right, thank you. Um, so as a part of the push for Ethereum 2.0, EIP44s would add pruning historical data in Ethereum clients. And the problem that it's it's there to address is that the state required to run a client to verify the chain is currently over 400 gigabytes and it's getting larger all of the time. Um, so typically, if you want to run a, a light client or well, a client that, is, that verifies the chain, um, it would require a one terabyte disk to run. And a part of the Ethereum ethos is that anyone should be able to validate the chain on consumer grade hardware. The way things are looking, they're soon going to be pushing the limits of uh, what could be considered to be consumer grade, right? A one terabyte disk is not something that everyone has. Um, so the idea then is to prune any state older than one year in Ethereum which is no longer required to validate new blocks. 
this turns out to be more than half of the state eligible for pruning. So it would reduce the hardware requirements from a one terabyte disk to a, a 500 megabyte disk in, in the short term and, and probably ongoing due to other, other reasons. Um, and this ties back into um, Ethereum 2.0 because they want to be syncing from something called a weak subjectivity checkpoint um, instead of syncing from Genesis all the time, which is like a fast forwarded part of, of history. It's kind of the same thing that we talk about. Um, we talk about warp sync for subgraphs. Um, and, and using weak subjectivity checkpoints is is required um, for the security model and proof of stake and, and Ethereum 2.0. So what does that have to do with the graph? Um, once Ethereum clients no longer store historical date that's older than one year, they will also be unable to serve queries for that state. And the prominent voices, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Ethereum community, including Vitalik himself, have publicly endorsed the graph as a replacement for the JSON RPC API in Ethereum to query this historical data. In fact, uh, the graph is mentioned even in the text of EIP 44's uh, proposal for, the, for this purpose. Um, so there, there, there are two things that would need to happen though for dApp developers that are still relying on the, the JSON RPC API to be able to have a smooth transition over to using the graph to serve that data. The first thing that we need is something called the Ethereum network subgraph. And uh, someone in the, in the community would need to build this, maybe a core dev, maybe a grant or uh, whoever. But what that would be is instead of building a subgraph for the specific purposes of a dApp, um, we would build a subgraph that is able to index all of the sort of data relevant to the Ethereum chain in, a, in an agnostic way. Um, and thereby be able to mimic the JSON RPC API. So you would be able to query things like logs or account balances or receipts or all that information. Um, it might require some, some updates to graph node in order to be able to support this. I'm not sure. I know that's something that we looked at a long time ago, um, but um, we need to dig that out again and, and pick that back up. Um, the second thing that needs to happen is to keep the trust model the same for the dApp developer. We would need to move our verifiability story to a one of n model. That's the same trust model that a, um, a consumer would rely on for um, ensuring the liveness of light clients. So we need to have that same level of trust uh, for all of dApp developers to feel comfortable migrating from Ethereum to the graph, both for um, the whole story of it, verifiable indexing and verifiable queries. We don't necessarily need all of our feature set covered by one event trust model just yet, but at least everything that would be used by the Ethereum not network subgraph um, and to, to be able to mimic the same queries. Um, so at least say verifiable index, verifiable queries for like get by ID would be useful for things like account balances, but not necessarily features like um, where and skip and, and you know more com complex features. Um, all right, so to give you an idea then of where we're at, like what is a one of n trust model in relation to the graph and um, what needs to be implemented to get there, um, it'll give a, a light overview of the stages of verifiability that we have in the graph. Um, basically, in order to um, allow us to both develop quickly and have high levels of security, we move different features through a pipeline of verifiability stages where they start with um, higher levels of trust and then end on validity proofs, which require basically no trust at all. If you have a trusted block hash, then you can get all of the other information that you um, care about from the indexer, so you don't have to trust anyone. Um, those stages are experimental, arbitration, fraud proofs, and validity proofs. And in the, um, the first stage, uh, experimental, is generally reserved for features that are not fully implemented. Maybe their, their API is not fleshed out yet, or there's debate around what the right API should be. They're, they're sort of 
stable or maybe they have a outsized difficulty in being able to make the feature deterministic. So things like full text search or IPFS data sources or rather file data sources fall into that category. Um, and then a, a feature that is in the experimental stage cannot have its security guarantees um, enforced by the protocol um, because it, it's not deterministic or, or what have you. So you can't say compare attestations. Instead, a consumer needs to rely on the reputation of an indexer. So what they might do if they're relying on an experimental feature like um, full text search is maybe not use that feature in production or maybe be sure to select indexers which are long-term incentive aligned with the protocol um, so that they can rely on the reputation of that indexer. It's not where we want any feature to be. Um, ideally, we're moving things quickly to arbitration. And in fact, most uh, features are in the arbitration stage today. Um, the arbitration stage is when indexers sign attestations for things. This is um, query attestations and it's proofs of indexing. They sign these commitments to data, which can be brought to the chain and um, shown in a uh, dispute. Um, and then the, the arbitrators, which are elected by the graph council, will then verify that that work has been done correctly and their penalties of slashing for not doing the work correctly. Um, so that's a, a governance uh, model. You have to you have to rely on um, the arbitrators basically to be active and anonymous participants. Um, from there, we would like to move to fraud proofs, um, and fraud proofs are are the one of n model where um, instead of necessarily relying on governance, um, any participant, if there's at least one participant in the network that is active and honest then they can force everyone else to also be active and honest. And they usually do this with something like um, a refereed game, maybe in a style of what Arbitrum has, where you can bisect computation um, and play out this little game that um, will surely tell you if, at least, if one of them is correct, they'll be able to always win that game and then the, uh, the loser will, will be slashed. And so those are, are pretty cool. And it's something that we've been looking at for a long time for um, for indexing. Uh, that's one of the reasons that our subgraphs are compiled to WASM, actually, is because WASM is amenable to these fraud proofs. The next stage, um, which is the, the highest stage, which doesn't even require one of n, it's just fully trustless, is uh, validity proofs. And with validity proofs, um, you're able to show the, the consumer somehow that the computation has been done correctly. Uh, one technique that, that we use for this is um, ZK snarks and um, the maybe like Merkle proofs are actually a form of validity proofs. Um, but generally the idea is you try to provide some succinct amount of data that the consumer can then verify that the, the computation is done correctly. Um, so to get everything to the one event model, we need um, at least fraud proofs. Uh, which is going to be our, our targeting, uh, what we target in the short term for, for indexing. Um, and then we can have anything fraud proofs or higher. Um, so we will do validity proofs for queries because it's, validity proofs is something that we've been working on for years now at the graph. Um, we've been investing ahead of time, realizing that that was going to be an important component of Web3. Um, so rather than do fraud proofs as an intermediate step, we'd like to then just uh, bring validity proofs to production um, and to support queries. Um, and the, the update on that is that road, the Roadrunner snark, which is the snark that um, the snark force has been developing for Scalar, is nearing the, the design freeze. We'll be pulling in Arial. Uh, to, to help us do things like compare the verifier gas costs on L1 and L2. Um, and once we kind of confirm that what we um, have, have made is going to actually be efficient, then um, we'll be able to freeze the design on Roadrunner. Um, and the Roadrunner snark 
it turns out, um, it, you know, it's built for Scalar, but it turns out to be applicable to verifiable queries as well. So our next step there, once we finalize the design of Roadrunner for Scalar, is to, to then split the design team from the implementation team. Um, so the implementation team can get Scalar over the line and into production, while the design team then moves to adapt Roadrunner to verifiable queries. And so that's that's kind of uh, what we're all doing to to help move EIP 44s forward and um, to make sure that the graph is a is a necessary part of the the DApp developer experience. Amazing! Thanks for sharing, Zach. Uh, very nice. I, I think that's a good segue into um, Samayotic Sam, who's been working with us since Wave One. Maybe we can share. Uh, exactly what the team has been working on and 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 just do a quick intro on particularly this what I, what you just called snark force which is actually a name that i quite like um sam will you be up to do a quick update here sure pedro um so i'm going to uh uh i'm going to just give a, a little background on semiotic um because yeah, so you'll we're going to be working uh, with Zach and the rest of the team to uh, we've been working with Zach and the rest of the uh, Snark Force team to design uh, these new uh, the new Roadrunner Snark. So I'm just going to give you a little story, a little bit bit of back history about uh, about us. Uh, we we were co-founded or we we were founded two years ago and. Uh, uh, we have three co uh, four co-founders three of us uh, uh, we're what we're all uh, we all come from r d so three of us have phds and uh, the fourth one was working in r d as well and uh, just as a little uh, you know we were, we were doing uh, industrial r d specifically so when you hear r d and you hear phds you probably you might think academia uh, and academics are, are, are publication driven. So that's, that's how their uh, careers progress is through, you know, getting papers. Industrial R&D is more focused on delivering uh, maybe proofs of concept or pushing things into production. So for example, uh, well, and specifically, so where do we come from? So half of us came from uh, the a an AI background and the other half of us came from a cryptography background. Uh, I actually have, um, experience and education in both. Um, so Gokai, so Gokai Saldamli is one of our co-founders. He's a cryptographer. He's also a professor at San Jose State University. And uh, prior to San Jose State University and Semiotic, he was, uh, he was at Samsung. And at Samsung, he designed um, their core IP for their cryptographic hardware accelerators for their SIM cards. So he, he, um, he did the Verilog, which is a hardware description language. He wrote all of the Verilog for their cryptography accelerators. And then he had that Verilog deployed in billions of devices. So he's like this hardcore mathematician implementer guy. And I just wanted to give you, you know, a feel of that, that you know, that sort of, the sort of team that we're trying to build or that we are building. And then, so uh, this, so maybe let's go back to the, um, Okay, so just to kind of complete the story. So the, for the first year of, of the company, we focused on fully homomorphic encryption. So specifically what we uh, did was we were building a, a, a tool that was gonna be, that was to be deployed in the cloud for uh, encrypted machine learning as a service using fully homomorphic encryption. So, so what is this uh, homomorphic encryption? At a high level, it lets you do it lets you compute directly on encrypted data. So, for example, let's say you had uh, A, where A is some number, and you encrypt. I encrypt it, and I have B, and B is some number, and I encrypt it. I can send you A and B, and you can add them and you can multiply them, um, but you can never know what A is or B is or any intermediate result. And through addition and multiplication, you can actually do a lot of sophisticated things for example you can evaluate deep neural networks uh, for me so you can do all the work for me and so i can outsource it to you 
and then uh, you never see any intermediate results. You can send it back to me. So we did that for a year. Uh, we got we got uh, attention and money from the government, from the military, but no, you know, not a lot of traction from uh, from industry because their industry is mainly driven by regulation, and regulations don't cover uh, currently homomorphic encryption. Um, so then we we started working. Uh, uh, after about a year, we started working uh, with the graph. We were part of the Wave One uh, graph grants, and uh, we did. Uh, we focused on reinforcement learning initially, and then uh, after that, we we started expanding into uh, cryptography. Um, really, with uh, Zach being the champion uh, for that. And so now we have uh, we have uh, three people uh, that are working full time with the Snark Force. And uh, this team, uh, you know, like Zach said, uh, the graph and edge node has been putting a lot of effort uh, for for several years uh, into um, planning for where we are now. And so we, what we bring is a solid uh, background in uh, understanding cryptography and cryptographic primitives. And you should see it, the SNARK, the field of SNARKs and zero, zero knowledge proofs, this field is exploding uh, right now in terms of academic uh, ideas and progress. And the SNARK force is at the uh, bleeding edge of, of, being, of, of integrating what is just becoming theoretically possible. And they're, they are making the most, they're turning it into a practical system and it is, it's going to be, you know, it is at the, it's at the leading edge of, of snark designs. Um, so, yeah, so I think I'll stop there. We're super happy uh, and excited to be uh, working on this and it's, it's going to be a big deal when it's uh, deployed. Great. Thanks, Sam. One quick mentioning of Justin Thaler as well. That's been working with you guys and Edge and Node as well, right? Um, Justin Thaler is on the, uh, Academia side, working also on ZK Snarks uh, with, a, with the team. So pretty good task force to tackle this for sure. Great. Uh, going back to um, Alex, you mentioned something interesting about Solana and an issue you've been, uh, you've been trying to tackle on indexing and syncing, the complexities around it, how we can bootstrap the indexer community in a secure way. Do you want to share some notes? you want to open the discussion now here? <clears throat> I think it was sort of a follow-up on, on Yaniv's comment. Uh, we had a quick chat uh, because, you know, Solana is going to produce, because we're doing Firehose integration of Solana, it's going to produce a lot of files. There's a lot of data there, like talking gigabytes per day, sometimes more, like maybe. So there's a lot of data, and then maybe people don't want to go about and produce that data from Genesis, because that's relatively hard, and they'll want to share the already produced data. So we'll need to figure out ways to make sure we still have verifiability of that data, cross-checking, you know, eventually slashing, some ways to, or devise a sort of, of an economy to share these things. This is similar to the notion of, uh, I'm going to say time warp again, um, warp sync, right? So that like either subgraphs or firehose, you know, backing history could be shared between indexers and sold and have an economy there to, uh, so that people don't need to play, play things from Genesis or people don't need to replay subgraphs from the beginning, incurring the time that it takes, but, you know, just preload them in their databases. So it was just had a few ideas about you know, how we that could happen. We had discussions also earlier um, uh, you know, about sharing information about the pre-processed subgraphs. Let's imagine the data dumps from Postgres. What if people could share that and speed up their syncing and then continue on just you know sync. But how do you verify the the uh, the integrity of that data? How would you verify? Do you make sure that it's a uh, respectable data and it's validated in some ways. <clears throat> so I had some ideas, but that's the problematic that we're seeing arrive or the opportunity, I would say, for an, a new type of economy. Yeah, Yaniv, I see. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I just want to add to that, that, 
you know, I do think that it's a really great thing about our indexer community that most of the indexers, it seems, are running their own archive nodes and they are validating from Genesis. And I think that that is really important, especially in a world where we expect fewer clients to actually be validating, you know, themselves, you know, the, the role of the indexers in the graph network might actually be that of, you know, the clients in a blockchain network that actually do the validation, right? If somebody's going to validate the chain, it should be our indexers, you know, the, 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 the folks that have, you know, bigger servers that are more professionals, um, you know, running these nodes. That said, not everybody's going to do it. So to me, part of, of the trick is, you know, still how do we encourage as many people as possible to validate the chain, to add as much security as possible to the different networks while still allowing for um, a path for folks that, you know, need to optimize for speed and maybe weren't going to do it anyways. And then still, you know, what are the security kind of guarantees going to be how much security is there on these snapshots that are getting warp synced. Right. That's the discussion sort of needs to happen. Have ideas, people have ideas, that's, that'd be useful. I have a few ideas, but I want to hear other people first. Warp sync is no less secure than a weak subjectivity checkpoint. Yeah, I was gonna. I posted this in the chat, but Solana is basically already living in like a post EIP 44s world, you know, in the sense that you have full nodes or you have nodes that can't sync from Genesis, and like state snapshots are basically kind of shared through social consensus. So, I think this is a really good test case for you know figuring out what the story looks like for, you know, not just Solana but for Ethereum and probably many other chains that will end up going in this direction. What are possible solutions to that? You know, what are things that? I, yeah, just another piece of um, of context is that uh, you know I I would kind of separate you know warp syncing or snapshots of the underlying blockchain um, like full node data and um, the snapshots for like the subgraph data, and I think both are valuable. You know, if if folks are trying to like sync Solana and we can help them like quickly get their Solana nodes you know, up and running. I think that's, you know, valuable. And, you know, the indexers are probably in the best position to like help each other kind of get up and running. Um, uh, but that is also, I think, separate from like subgraph data. Um, so I guess there's DB snapshots of subgraphs so you can get straight to uh, to sync at a, at a specific block. I also think from an incentive standpoint, some of the, you know, parts of the, uh, of the problem are um, incentives for providing the snapshots in the first place, and then um, incentives for sharing the snapshots with others. Um, you know, for example, we have query fees in the network, of course, which is you know for end users, um, you know, paying for queries. You know, would there be an equivalent here for you know, for example, you know, payments? per byte or per something, if you just want to like download a giant, you know, multi-terabyte snapshot from somebody. There's, there's, there's also the kind of third uh, bucket of data, which is the fire hose output, the, the historical flat files. Um, so, so yeah, the underlying node data, the fire hose flat files, and then the subgraph data, and, and each of them, you know, makes sense to offer as, as some kind of sync solution or bootstrapping solution for new indexers. Would, would the firehose data be easily derivable from the uh, full node data? No, it requires execution. Right. Okay. So in some ways, time. yeah, in some ways the firehose data feels like a superior option for like nodes to load data from. I think we talked about this in Lisbon a little bit, but like, even if you look at like, what EIP 44s is planning to do, they're planning to shim together multiple, uh, like different versions of, of the Ethereum client into like kind of a virtual client that can actually sync from Genesis. And that becomes a lot easier to do safely if those things are just loading from like Firehose files, right? Like you could basically have one version of the node syncing, it's outputting Firehose uh, files, and then the next one kind of loads its state right at the point where that sort of, uh, 
uh, the consensus logic changed. Yeah, Alex, were you saying that uh, one of the goals for Firehose was, it, was that you could basically like hydrate a full node from the Firehose data because it was like a, it would be a superset? So yes, that's a design goal, right? Now some implementations, for example, near does not have the full data to be able to do that. Maybe I'm wrong here, but that's the goal so that you could, and even cross hydrate, right? You extract data from, I don't know, open Ethereum and you hydrate get because the data is not different. Maybe you build some few indexes that are specific to that node because it, it lays out some data in some ways and specifically, but it would be nothing missing. That's the design goal of the fire hose. Yeah. So, so, so oh, go ahead. sorry, Aniva. I, I, yeah, just wanted to plus one Brandon's comment about you know distributing fire hose flat files as as the kind of um, authoritative source for that data. I, I think it's going to be way easier to come to consensus on. Um, you know, effectively the correct data to, to do so just through like hashes of the flat files is is a lot simpler and, a mu and much easier to verify um, than and recreating a, a rock state. Stevie database, right? Then yeah, a, exactly. a database or a, a, you know, a disk, a ZFS disk snapshot, which can have, you know, compacted, non-compacted state. And, and one thing I'd like to add is that the unit economics of all the different three mechanisms we discussed are all the same because they're flat data, like imagining CSV files for Postgres, flat files for, for, Postgres, uh, for, for Firehouse, as you said, and eventually a RocksDB dump tar JZ. Like it's the same sort of cost model. I think paying for bytes works as a unit economic. So one sort of economic solution could deal with the three of them. That's what I think is interesting. We could have a pattern that is quite simple and feed a lot of things for the future. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like the, the rough shape of, of the solution here would be to have some kind of like staking contract where, you know, you would register here's like a snapshot, you know, um, provide the hash and then like some kind of deposit, like an amount that you're staking on that snapshot. Presumably other people could also like stake on the same snapshot. And then we consider that to be the economic security because if someone basically disputes it, you need like a dispute protocol, um, then uh, whoever staked on it would, would get slashed. Right. Rather than, I, I, you know, I think it definitely makes sense to explore, you know, direct delivery through something like an HTTP endpoint. But I think it'd be really great to explore more decentralized protocols for sharing data across a network of participants. I mean, WebTorrent uh, comes to mind, um, you know, like there are versions of, of the BitTorrent protocol that get run entirely. Um, I, yeah, I mean, we could effectively distribute data that way. And in some sense, you also, you kind of get like a scaling of um, capacity and con and kind of social consensus based on the number of seeds for a given hash, um, you know, and it all kind of seamlessly, the network and the capacity to serve data through it scales as more indexers join. If you do have like, you know, 50 indexers colluding though with like a bad snapshot, like they, you know, they've just kind of inserted some malicious fake data, you know, altered the database or whatever. Um, you would be found with there not being any penalties. So you have to decouple, I guess, two things. Like one is like, what's the mechanism that proves the correctness of fire host files that are generated? And then the other is the economic layer for serving those files. And those are right. sort of two separate design considerations. And so like the, the Web3 torrent, and honestly, like the graph should serve files. Like we already like have a pattern where many users like link to an IPFS file from like an entity attribute. And that should just sort of be a seamless developer experience. Like when you're querying an entity and you want to grab a, a file that it links to, like that should all be supported by our state channels and, uh, and query market. And then the second part is, is um, you know, how do you prove the correctness if the files generated by the fire hose, like instrumented node? And that looks a lot closer to like verifiable indexing, right? Like where you want some kind of deterministic process that, you know, you could do uh, uh, potentially like a section protocol figure out where two nodes diverge and then prove uh you know prove that 
you know, one execution path was, you know, was correct and the other one was, was incorrect. And there might be stake attached to that, right? Right. I, I would imagine that we're not going to be able to like run you know, entire you kind blockchain of do like an, nodes um, uh, in Wasm. It could either be like a proof of stake thing or it could be like an optimistic to another chain. Brandon, I think you're having issues with your network. There's a lot of lag now, just to let, let you know. Yeah, I think sorry, you need to say I, I, something. Yeah, I was just saying, um, I wouldn't expect that we would be able to run like blockchain nodes in Wasm to be able to do like a full bisection protocol, but like, you know, syncing nodes kind of by construction of the blockchain nodes like should be deterministic and you should be able to get to consensus and you might not be able to prove on chain you know, where the syncing went wrong, but it feels like, you know, voting, like some kind of, you know, uh, voting process could be used, you know, for, in a dispute resolution protocol. You know, I could imagine that each block be sort of hashed together and sign either atomically or Merkleize across, I don't know, a thousand blocks, one chunk, chunk, chunk. And at some point you, you have a tree and you publish that one. So you could prove that you did sign all of them. Mm -hmm. It could be verified and you would publish from time to time, but to have that granularity and, and maybe when you're in the more real time, because there's that issue also, if you want speed, right? There's a trade-off between the allocations that you put when you close an allocation, it's, let's say it's 10 hours late. And then you have all that time that could have, you know, things that are happening, uh, I don't know, collusion or whatever. So maybe there's also the fact that we receive some, for some blocks, the signature right away, and then eventually it gets cobbled up to on chain, but you can, I don't know, probably dispute it faster, like maybe one, two blocks late. I, I was wondering about the staking part though, because, um, if on top of creating the data set and then um, providing the data set, meaning bandwidth uh, for downloading, you need on top to provide more financial means to, to deliver it basically as a service. Is that the right approach? And can we not have something that the payment for uh, getting the data from the provider is locked for a certain time and can be, can be returned or something like that and provide the sort of the, the protection in terms of the data correctness in that sense, rather than having to stake on already uh, potentially significant resources that you're putting in. It's an interesting point. Um, so is this something that we feel like, it doesn't seem like it would be a blocker, let's say for Solana support, but I guess, you know, we've opened up the conversation now to say that this is probably something that we should tackle at some point. Um, maybe we find an owner to, you know, run a little bit further, kind of thinking through a, a, a proposed design. And I mean, do we want to reflect on like what kind of time frames would make sense to try to get something like this? I'd, I'd participate in some group. I like all the verifiable things I wouldn't lead, but I'd like to participate in, and work on that. As for the time frame, you know, I think what we're going to see is that people are going to have handshake deals to share these files. Like it's going to have costs, you don't know, 10,000 bucks to process. So you maybe you sell it for 2,000 because you hope to sell it five times. And when we could perhaps gather some of that, you know, indexer community insight and, and see how we transform that into a on-chain business and, mm -hmm. and, and then secure it in some ways. But I think, you know, writing contracts for that, designing the thing is going to take a little bit of time. So if we want it done at some point and the economy to participate in, in the graph economy, right, with the token. So we, we, it's better sooner than later to at least think about it. I'd also like to participate, but probably don't have the bandwidth to own. Cool. So we we'll just right, need to find one owner. Yeah, no worry. We just need to find one owner then, and we have a, a task force now. Cool. Okay, we're right at the uh, top of the hour. I think we should wrap up here. Nice discussion. Pretty cool. Thanks for joining all. Uh, happy Christmas. Happy New Year. I'll see you in a month. Do be on the lookout in the forum. We'll be sharing some new up updates. As mentioned, we will be re uh, revamping the uh, Foundation's Notion. 
So you have all of these uh, working working groups sharing updates uh, in there, so you can all follow along with all of these uh, upcoming milestones. Thanks all. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks everyone. Hey. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.